lessons and experiences at Yale. And I hope that this can be an opportunity for um, the engagement to continue in terms of mentoring and other opportunities that we are trying to begin through the Yale Alumni Association and our special interest groups that the AYA has started to support and staff. So now we have a wonderful staff person who couldn't be here tonight, and it was Roman Lewis, who is class of 93, and he serves as the uh, liaison for black alumni and um, the university, and particularly the house, given the number of things that we have been doing over the years to engage alums. And we've been quite fortunate to have a tremendous fundraising effort over the last few years that helped renovate the uh, cultural center and created an endowment that's named after these three guys here, Young, Ogilvy, Robbie Armstead, and Glendy Shabir, all founders of the Cultural Center and also founders of African American Studies at Yale, who unfortunately have passed away in their, in their honor, uh, other members of their class, and the Cultural Center who joined the forces to create an endowment that bring some of the interesting speakers that we have on campus uh, because of the endowment leadership opportunities. And I'd just like to take this moment to introduce Ivy Onyeda, who is the coordinator for ORD, as we call it for short, the leadership forum. Ivy is a sophomore and is fantastic and one of the staff here at the Cultural Center. And so we are grateful for her support and work. Uh, I think everyone knows me, but I'll just say I'm Pamela George, assistant dean in Yale College, and also doing a lot of growth and development. As I was mentioning to my partner over there, Tom Ficklin, who is our photographer, and so he's a partner to the house because he helps to document the work that we do here. He's um, so a videographer, a photographer, graduate of Yale Kennedy School. Um, it's a sweat and pain, but it's been worth it. And this is one of those gatherings where you really do see uh, the benefit of all that. We're excited to be a part of uh, the life of undergraduates and the, the next steps that will carry us even further. So without further delay, I'd like to have the uh, alums who are here with us to introduce themselves. All of you, I think, have received a copy of some of the bios, um, but we've got a number of alums here who, uh, I don't want to take a lot of time just reading the bios. I'd like the alumni to introduce themselves and, <coughs> and whatever order you would like, just by starting off with saying uh, just a few words about what you do, um, what you were involved in at Yale, and your or a defining moment that you had at Yale, if you can think of one defining moment at Yale. And then we will open it up for questions, because this is meant to be a dialogue, and other undergraduates are excited to talk to you. So. <laughs> <laughs> the summer was very close. Um, my major at Yale was, well, it doesn't exist anymore, was study of the city. It was a short major, it didn't last that long, but it allowed you a lot of flexibility to study history, politics, pretty math, and to get out of here and be happy. <laughs> As opposed to some disciplines where they had to make you walk a regiment, we kind of brought up on campus. Back in the mid-50s, my father took over the stewardship of the Elizabethan Club, which is at 459 College Street. So from the time I was like 13, I lived here on campus. So I always believed that I was going to be here. That was absolutely the only place I wanted to go to school. And it's the only place I applied to when I finished high school in 1961. <laughs> I didn't get in. But it was still my aspiration to come. And I knew at the time, because they still had a draft, that you had to put in your military service. So I enlisted in the military. And it was, for me, the best thing I could have done because it was just at the beginning of the Vietnam era. But it wasn't into the highlight of the, not the mid 60s and 70s, and uh, when it really got hot. But I got the GI Bill, and what it allowed me to do when I got out, it was three years in active, I got out. I still wanted to come to Yale. 
I came back to New Haven. I worked for a while and went to New Haven College, which is now University of New Haven. And then I decided in 68 to transfer to Yale College. I had a 3.9 something in average. I was a townie, I was a veteran, I was black. And Yale had changed in the 1950s and early 61 when I was rejected. There were only five blacks at Yale College, class of 65. And one of them was actually kicked out of the university for breaking a lamp on the cross campus. So it was a different place. A. Whitney Griswold at the time was the president of the university. It wasn't that Yale didn't care about blacks, they didn't think about us. It was a kind of benign indifference. And they took blacks, but not in huge numbers. By the time I came back, Yale had changed, and we had different president of the university, King and Brewster, who was much more interested in minorities and, and actually expanding the university. So when I came finally uh, to apply, I uh, figured it was a, was a, was a Dutch street. Friday afternoon, I got a letter of rejection again. The next Friday, I was in Yale College. The message is that if you want something bad enough, you have to fight for it. And particularly if we're a minority, it is not going to be given to you. But if you want it bad enough, all they can say is no. If you don't apply, you'll never know what the answer is going to be. So for you, the defining moment for me, it certainly was that moment when I decided I had nothing to lose and I was going to fight for it. So I felt they had made a mistake. It's also the year they took a lot of women. There weren't that many minorities coming up in New York College. But I had a choice of coming as a sophomore, a junior, <coughs> and coming back in the sophomore because I had to take all my science courses to get into medical school. And so, even as a senior, I was taking organic and physics. Not recommended. <laughs> <laughs> and Chicago Medical School wouldn't look at my application because I hadn't finished organic. But in the interim, my first semester, I had different chemistry courses now. Chem 10 was general chemistry. We finished the textbook, 30 chapters in the first semester. Chem 33 was organic. We started organic chemistry the second semester. So by the time I was taking it as a senior, I actually had a half a year of organic. And when I took the MCATs, I ended up in the 99 percentile. Mainly because I had organic. It looked different on paper. I was still taking it. I was doing well in organic. And, and all the basic sciences. I had good recommendations. I was older, I was a veteran, I was black. So I ended up getting into Yale and Harvard. I also got into Howard University. Until this day, I do not know if I got in. The only school, now back in the day when, when I was applying to school, there were so few of us, we actually got a few waivers to apply to medical school. So I got a few waiver almost every place. Howard said, send the money. <laughs> send the money. And my best friend, who also was a townie, was a year ahead of me, who went to Howard Med. He was darker as that wall. And they still had brown bag parties at Howard Medical School, where if you were darker than that bag on the door, you couldn't go to the party. He said to me, Matt, you don't want to go there. Except for one thing, they're going to think you're a foreigner, because you don't speak like they do. <laughs> so he said, he just wanted to finish Howard. But to this day, after I sent the money, I do not know if I got in or in there. And that's been since then, too. You know? So that's a story. But the in, ingredient that I want you to remember is that as Yalies, you belong to a vast community of alum and friends who will be your friends and associates all the rest of your life if you want them to. Very few of the alumni, the black alumni, will turn their back to another alum, particularly a black brother or sister. So all you really have to do is reach out to us. And if we know that you need something, and if we can, in fact, supply it, we will. And all my friends from Yale College, and actually, Yale College was a lot of fun, even though it was criminal in terms of the 60s. I had a big, big afro. It was really <laughs> radical. It's hard to believe, but true. And um, all my friends back then are still friends now. And my friends from medical school and so forth, we're all very close. And so I suspect you will have the same. But all the blacks in the class of the 60s and the early 70s kind of knew each other. I kind of knew each other in passing, but we kind of knew who we were and we were a cadre. And Glenda Shapiro was really one of the people who started this place. But it's also a classmate around my time. It's a year ahead of me. But he passed away, unfortunately. And so did my friend Harry Huggins, who was one of the five blacks who got into the class of 65. And, uh, but we're still here, some of us. I'm 66 years old, so I'm old. 
But if you, in fact, need somebody to talk to, or if I can help you, clearly, uh, I'll be easily contacted through this AOA, or AOA, or Abraham House. Thank you. Yes. So it's been a long time. This is the first time I've been back to New Haven. Mm -hmm. Core, that's one of our programs. And I've primarily done government um, work as an attorney. That, I ended up in, in government service sort of by accident. <clears throat> Yale, I think, has something to do with it, but maybe it's just the legal culture in the 70s that had more to do with it. My first summer, when they, or the first fire in their general counsel office, and I didn't really spend any time with the lawyers. I actually spent all my time going to the systems of education in higher education. So Elliot versus Richardson, when I look at that, I say, that's what I spent my summer doing the research on. Nobody ever talked to me about it again, but when that decision was rendered, I said, that's what I, I was doing the legwork for that, that summer. Um, I also got married that summer, and my husband transferred from Princeton. He was in the divinity. He was at the seminary at Princeton. He transferred here to the divinity school. So my next two years were really sort of busy trying to figure out how to survive the rest of law school and survive being married to a graduate student at the same time. But what, the thing that happened at Yale when I went during my second year to interview. And I interviewed and got a second interview and got flown to Pittsburgh um, for a firm there. And then didn't get offered a summer associate job. It turned out that there was a black student um, in the LLM program at the law school who was from the same firm. And he said, I had interviewed and at least one other black student had interviewed. And they offered him the position because I was married they didn't really think I would come that summer, even though I had told them that I would. So it sort of didn't matter that you made it to Yale. There were still reasons that people could pick you off. My husband wanted to go into the military chaplaincy. And I decided that I would try the Judge Advocate General Court in the Army. And so I did that um, for just a few years. <clears throat> then I ended up working as a civilian attorney for the Department of the Army for about 13 years. And then I've been at the corporation for about 11 years. So I sort of ended up in government service by accident. But it's been a place where I've felt that I could contribute. Um, and it's been a rewarding career for me. And um, so pleased to be here and, and, and uh, thanking George as well as uh, Nicholas Lewis for the invitation. Um, my um, career has been illustrious, but in, I think, different ways, but also share some of the, the themes, which is that when I graduated with my degree in English, having spent three and a half years as a biology major, but didn't want to take <laughs> physics. <laughs> five years at Yale, so I went to my advisor and I said, I've got about a semester left, what can I graduate with? So English, English it was. Um, so you can see I was very prepared for my career in my life after Yale. Um, it was 1993, we were in a recession, I think you may have heard that term recently. Um, jobs were scarce, similar, um, and I'd done the, the investment banking and the consulting interviews, and, and nothing really clicked with me kind of emotionally, spiritually. Um, so I spent six months traveling. I um, said to all of my family and friends, uh, I love you, I love cash, cash for graduation is a good thing. And so what seems like such a small amount of money, but I want to say it was maybe $2,000, I volunteered in, um, in Europe for the, those six months. So I would volunteer three to four weeks on a project, then spend another week or so traveling. 
And although it came after my time at Yale, I feel like that was my defining moment because it crystallized my education, but also my aspirations for life, how I wanted to be in the world, how I wanted to be perceived, what I wanted you know, my experience to represent. The only representation was on TV, and then it was only sports stars or entertainers. There was a lot of unpacking to do, uh, being an American overseas. So, um, but I, I thank Yale for the preparation that gave me the ability to speak truths about my experience, about what it meant to, to, to be American. So I came back um, the fall of 93, and <clears throat> on accident, on purpose, uh, started working at a, an investment bank because, well, there was a job and it paid decently. And so here I am 13 years later in the financial <coughs> services sector. I work in human resources. and. My focus is on, on talent, talent development, um, the uh, development of organizations with how they plan for their future success. Um, and I think there's no better time than now for a number of, of the financial services firms to really commit to that, whether it be uh, diversity by gender, by, by race or ethnicity, <coughs> sexual orientation, etc. But then also what it means to be a leader. So how do you inculcate those values in your um, executives so that it's not a pass the buck when it comes to, well, was that the right thing to do for your shareholders? Or um, did, did, was there a feeling that um, as your uh, portfolio was going underwater, you couldn't say anything? There's just many, many things I think that, that, uh, that can be spoken now. And so, I felt that 
my life at that point in time was more heavily oriented towards the private sector, um, and I was not spending enough time um, uh, being mission driven. So I uh, called an all stop, shut it all down. Um, I had a long conversation with my wife. Uh, and six year old, six month old daughter didn't really understand what I was saying. And we uh, cashed it in, uh, sold our house in Indiana. I spent about 18 months uh, after that. Uh, the, the gentleman I was working for at Harvard uh, took a job as the president and CEO of the Boston Foundation, which is a roughly $1 billion community foundation in Boston. Um, he asked me to come along with him, and um, I served as the chief of staff uh, for the Boston Foundation for about um, two, two and a half to three years. Foundation gives out about 55 to 60 million dollars worth of grants to nonprofit organizations in Boston. So, as a result of that three year tenure, I got a chance to really get to know the folks in the nonprofit community in Boston very, very, very well. Um, uh, but again, after three years, I felt like my, um, my world was still out of balance. Uh, so, I had gone from being 100% oriented toward the private sector to being 100% oriented toward the nonprofit sector, so I sought to realign. Um, and uh, through a process that I will, if you're interested in how I did it uh, or how I do these, these job changes, I'll tell you it's bloody, but it works. Um, uh, I uh, took a job as a chief financial officer for an organization called the Massachusetts Convention Center Authority, which owns um, three convention centers and arena and um, a couple of parking garages. I'm a person doing, serving as a chief financial officer, and that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> but I did it. Uh, after a couple of years serving as a chief financial officer, um, I then uh, uh, took on my current role, which is the chief operating officer, um, which consolidated a couple of departments number of departments, everything from engineering and maintenance to sales to audiovisual, lighting, security, parking, transportation, and all that sort of stuff. Along the way, and I'm feeling a little bit more oriented today, but I have to admit to you, um, um, this guy is my witness, I'm still feeling a little misaligned. Okay. <laughs> so, stay tuned. <laughs>